Killing someone and claiming on the insurance will naturally avoid any claim if you are found out. But this actually occurred during a series of multiple murders in the 18th century that resulted in an insurance claim that kick-started the abolitionist movement and in the latter part of the century inspired a leading painter to include the incident as part of his plan to change modern art. This is the scandal of the Zong Massacre. In 1777, a newly built ship was named by its Dutch owners as the Zorg, which means care. It operated as a slave ship based in the Netherlands and was delivering enslaved Africans to the Dutch colony of Suriname in South America. It was a square stern ship of 110 tons. The British 16-gun brig HMS Alert captured it during the Fourth Anglo-Dutch War on the 10th of February 1781. It was brought to Cape Coast Castle in what is now Ghana, which was maintained and staffed along with other forts and castles by the Royal African Company, known as the RAC, and it was used as the regional headquarters. The RAC subsequently renamed the ship the Zong. In early March, the captain of the William, another slave trading ship, purchased the Zong on behalf of a syndicate of Liverpool merchants, which included Edward Wilson, George Case, James Aspinall, and William, James, and John Gregson. William Gregson had an interest in 50 slaving voyages between 1747 and 1780. He also served as mayor of Liverpool in 1762. By the end of his life, vessels in which Gregson had a financial stake had carried over 58,000 Africans to slavery in the Americas, of which it is estimated that over 9,000 perished en route. The ship was paid for with a bill of exchange, which is a binding agreement between buyer and seller, where the buyer agrees to pay a fixed sum of cash at a predetermined date. The 244 slaves already on board were part of the transaction. The ship was not insured until after it started its voyage. The insurers, another syndicate from Liverpool, underwrote the ship and its slaves for up to £8,000, approximately half the slaves' potential market value. The remaining risk was borne by the owners. The Zong was the first command of Luke Collingwood, formerly the surgeon on the William. While Collingwood lacked experience in navigation and command, Ship surgeons were typically involved in selecting captured Africans for purchase so that their medical expertise supported the determination of the commodity value of a captive. If the surgeon rejected a native, that individual suffered what was termed commercial death, being of no value and was liable to be killed by the African traders. Sometimes these killings happened in the presence of the surgeon. It is therefore likely that Collingwood had already witnessed the mass killing of slaves. Zong's first mate was James Kelsall, who had also served on the William. The vessel's only passenger was Robert Stubbs, a former captain of slave ships. In early 1780, he was appointed by the African Committee of the RAC as the governor of Ananabu a British fortification near Cape Coast Castle in Ghana. Due to his ineptitude and enmity that occurred with John Roberts, governor of the castle, Stubbs was forced out of the governorship by the RAC Council after only nine months. He was accused of being a semi-literate drunkard who mismanaged the slave trading activities of the fort. As he was aboard to return to Britain, 
Collingwood may have thought his earlier experience on slave ships would be useful. These ships often had to wait for up to a year before embarking on their journey to the Americas, as slaves needed to be captured and marched across country before their sale and subsequent transportation. It could be a long process. The Zong had a 17-man crew when it sailed from Africa, which was far too small to maintain adequate conditions on the ship. Sailors willing to risk disease and rebellions on slave ships were difficult to recruit in Britain, and were harder to find for a vessel captured from the Dutch. Consequently, it was manned by remnants of the previous Dutch crew, and some who came from the William, and with unemployed sailors hired from settlements along the African coast. On the 18th of August 1781, the ship slipped anchor from Accra, Ghana, and made its way across the Atlantic to its intended final destination at Jamaica to unload its human cargo in Black River. Its journey was expected to last eight weeks, but it only reached its final destination in Jamaica on the 22nd of December, after 12 weeks at sea. The song was designed for only 193 people, yet it contained a crew of a mere 17, and a reluctant and terrified cargo of 442 men, women and children, twice the number it could safely transport, as the accepted maximum number for this ship was 193. The men were held below deck in chains, and only allowed on deck for one hour for a revolting ceremony called Dancing the Slaves. The women and children were held in a type of stockade on deck, with holes to fire on any rebellious passengers. It is unclear who, if anyone, was in charge of the ship at this point, as Collingwood had been gravely ill for some time. The man who would normally have replaced him, first mate James Kelsall, had been suspended from duty following an argument on the 14th of November. Stubbs had captained a slave ship previously, and he temporarily commanded the Zong during Collingwood's incapacity, but he was not a registered member of the vessel's crew. The breakdown of the command structure on the ship might explain the subsequent navigational errors and the absence of checks on supplies of drinking water. The Caribbean was the jewel in the crown of the British Empire in the 18th century, as there was an insatiable appetite for sugar, but there was a chronic shortage of labour, even if it was free. The problem was that the manpower part of the economic equation came from slaves, sourced from over 3,000 miles away, so hence the journey. The slavers needed insurance, which was provided by a Liverpool syndicate called Gilbert and Associates, who offered terms of £30 per head of slaves. This amounted to half the value of the human cargo, the balance being the responsibility of the owners. The song stopped at Sao Tome, an island off the west coast of Africa, to replenish their fresh water and supplies and then continued on its way across the Atlantic towards Jamaica. It was supposed to stop off at Tobago for fresh water, and to top up the food supplies, but it was decided to continue sailing to Jamaica. On the 28th of November, the crew sighted Jamaica at a distance of 30 miles, but misidentified it as the French colony of San Dominique on the island of Hispaniola. Zong continued on its westward course, leaving Jamaica behind. This mistake was recognised only after the ship was 300 miles away from the island. Overcrowding, malnutrition, accidents and disease had already killed several sailors and approximately 62 Africans. Kelso later claimed that there was only four days' water remaining on the ship, 
when the navigational error was discovered and Jamaica was still up to 13 sailing days away. On the 29th of November, the crew assembled to consider the proposal that some of the slaves should be thrown overboard. Kelsall later claimed that he had disagreed with the plan at first, but it was soon unanimously agreed upon. On the 29th of November, 54 women and children were thrown over the side into the sea. On the 1st of December, 42 male slaves were thrown overboard and 36 more followed in the next few days. Another 10, in a display of defiance at the inhumanity of the slavers, chose to commit suicide by jumping into the sea. Having heard the shrieks of the victims as they were thrown into the water, one of the captives requested that the remaining Africans be denied all food and drink rather than being thrown into the sea. The crew ignored this request. A total of 142 Africans were killed in this way by the time the ship reached Jamaica. The crew claimed that the Africans had been jettisoned because the ship did not have enough water to keep them alive for the rest of the voyage. This claim was later disputed, as the ship had 420 gallons of water left when it finally arrived in Jamaica on the 22nd of December. An affidavit later made by Kelsall stated that on the 1st of December, when 42 slaves were killed, it rained heavily for more than a day, allowing six casks of water sufficient for ten days to be collected. If the slaves died on shore, the Liverpool ship owners would have no redress from their insurers. Similarly, if they died a natural death, as a contemporary term put it, at sea, then insurance could not be claimed. If some slaves were thrown overboard to save the rest of the cargo or the ship, then a claim could be made under the rule of general average, which is the principle that a captain who jettisons part of his cargo to save the rest can claim for the loss from his insurers. The ship's insurance covered the loss of slaves at £30 per person. Consequently, the journey to Jamaica was an economic disaster, and the captain, Luke Collingwood, died just two days after reaching their destination of Black River. The slave auctions were supposed to yield an average of £60 per head, but the Zong contingent only fetched £36 each. As the voyage had lasted over 12 weeks, instead of the usual eight weeks, all the food and provisions were gone, and would have to be replaced, and this ate into any profits. Having lost around half of the human cargo, together with the low prices being paid for each slave, made the trip a financial loss. During Gregson's slaving voyage days, he was one of the owners of the Zong and therefore experienced in these matters, the normal death rate was around 10%. But here the death rate was nearly half of those who had originally embarked on the voyage. On top of that, the Zong had to cross the Atlantic back to Liverpool in wartime conditions, with a much reduced sugar consignment as cargo, due to the lack of money raised from the sale of the surviving slaves, before it could show any financial return. Hence the need for insurance. The law on maritime insurance is quite specific, and is worth quoting. The insurer takes upon him the risk of the loss, capture and death of slaves, or any other avoidable accident to them. But natural is always understood to be expected. By natural death is meant not only when it happens, by disease and sickness, but also when the captive destroys himself through despair, which often happens. But when slaves are killed or thrown into the sea, 
in order to quell an insurrection on their part, then the insurers must answer. The law acknowledged that captives, even on well-maintained ships, would develop what was termed a fixed melancholy and be prone to suicide. The wording does not mention the circumstances of this, but by implication, any slaves that were jettisoned to save the ship could not have been classified as succumbing to a natural death. This was called general averages, hence the insurance claim. The ship's owners claimed compensation from their insurers for the loss of the slaves. The insurers refused to honour the claim, and the owners took them to court. Zong's logbook went missing after the ship reached Jamaica, two years before the hearing started. As such, the proceedings provide almost all the documentary evidence about the massacre, though there is no formal record of the first trial, other than what is referred to in the subsequent appeals hearing. The ship's insurers claimed that the log had been deliberately destroyed, which the Gregson Syndicate adamantly denied. The dispute was initially tried at the Guildhall in London on the 6th of March 1783, with the Lord Chief Justice, the Earl of Mansfield, overseeing the trial before a jury. Mansfield was previously the judge concerning a case which questioned the legality of enslaving people in Britain. He had ruled that slavery had never been established by statute and was not supported by common law. Stubbs was the only witness and the jury found in favour of the owners under an established protocol of maritime insurance that considered slaves as cargo. The insurers applied to Mansfield to have the previous verdict set aside and for the case to be tried again. A hearing was held at the Court of King's Bench in Westminster Hall on the 21st of May, before Mansfield and two other King's Bench judges. The Solicitor General, John Lee, appeared on behalf of the ship's owners, as he had done previously in the Guildhall trial. Summing up the verdict reached in the first case, Mansfield said that the jury had no doubt that the case of the slaves was the same as if horses had been thrown overboard. The question was whether there was not an absolute necessity for throwing them over the side to save the rest. The jury were of an opinion there was. At this hearing, the authorities realised the danger that an abolitionist called Granville Sharp posed. On the 19th of March, Aluda Equino, a former slave, told the anti-slave trade activist Sharp of the events aboard the Zong, and a newspaper soon carried a lengthy account, reporting that the captain had ordered the slaves killed in three batches. Sharp sought legal advice the next day about the possibility of prosecuting the crew for murder. Senior lawyer John Lee, the Solicitor General, attended court to correct this analysis by Sharp and clarify the current state of the law. His attack is worth quoting. What has this vast declaration of human beings been thrown overboard? The question after is, was it voluntary or an act of necessity? This was a case of chattels or goods. It is really so. It is the case of throwing over goods. It is really so, for this purpose and the purpose of insurance. They are goods and property, whether right or wrong. We have nothing to do with it. This property, the human creatures, if you will, have been thrown overboard, whether or not for the preservation of the rest. This is the real question. Collingwood had died in 1781, and the only witness of the massacre to appear at Westminster Hall was Stubbs although a written affidavit by first mate Kelsall was made available to the lawyers. Stubbs claimed there was an absolute necessity for disposing of the slaves, because the crew feared all the Africans would die if they did not throw some into the sea. 
The insurers argued that Collingwood had made a blunder and a mistake in sailing beyond Jamaica and that slaves had been killed so their owners could claim compensation. They alleged that Collingwood did this because he did not want his first voyage as a slave ship captain to be unprofitable. Lee responded by saying that the slaves perished just as a cargo of goods could perish and were jettisoned for the greater good of the ship. The insurer's lawyers replied that Lee's argument could never justify the killing of innocent people and that the actions of the crew were nothing less than murder. At the hearing, new evidence was heard about the heavy rain that had fallen on the ship on the second day of the killings, but still a third batch of slaves was thrown overboard. This led Mansfield to order another trial, because the rainfall meant that the killing of those people after the water shortage had been eased could not be justified in terms of the greater necessity of saving the ship and the rest of the slaves aboard, and that this evidence invalidated the findings of the jury in the first trial. As the jury had heard testimony that the water shortage resulted from the poor condition of the ship, brought on by unforeseen maritime conditions, rather than from errors committed by its captain, Mansfield concluded that the insurers were not liable for losses resulting from errors committed by the ship's crew. No member of the crew was ever prosecuted for murder. Even so, the Zong case did eventually gain both national and international attention. Parliament eventually passed an act forbidding insurers allowing claims by ship owners for murdering Africans by throwing them overboard. The decision of Mansfield, as seen as part of the start of the road to the abolition of slavery and slave ownership, his words are still quoted today. The nature of slavery is of such a nature that is incapable of being introduced on any reasons, moral or political, but only positive law. That is statute, which preserves its force long after the reasons, occasion and time itself, from whence it was created, is erased from memory. It's so odious that nothing can be suffered to support it but positive law. Whatever inconveniences which may follow from its decision, therefore may follow from a decision. I cannot say this case is allowed or proved by the law of England. But slavery existed throughout the rest of the British Empire and flourished until the 1833 Slavery Abolition Act. But it showed that Mansfield was adhering to the rule of law. To gauge the enormity of Britain's involvement with the transatlantic slave trade between 1791 and 1800, 1,340 ships transported nearly 400,000 African slaves to the Americas. Between 1801 to 1807, a further 266,000 unfortunate souls suffered the same fate. By this time, Britain was the biggest participant, but other nations also had a hand in this shameful trade. The newly formed United States needed slaves for its own plantations, whilst the French, Spanish, Portuguese, Dutch and even the Danes also participated in the trade. The demand for sugar, tobacco and rice was insatiable, and the slave-owning class were not going to give up their gains willingly. But the Zong massacre had galvanised public sentiment. As early as 1783, a petition calling for the abolition of slavery was presented to Parliament. Finally, an act was passed preventing the transport of captured slaves, and the government set about ways to abolish slavery throughout the British Empire, which was achieved in 1807. It was not until 1838 that slavery was finally abolished in the colonies. In 1840, a painting by the famous artist William Turner, entitled The Slave Ship, 
was entered at the annual summer exhibition at the Royal Academy. The painting depicts a vessel from which a number of manacled slaves have been thrown into the sea to be devoured by sharks. The painting was shown at an important time in the movement to abolish slavery in the world, as the exhibition opened one month before the first World Anti-Slavery Convention in London. 